Have you ever wondered exactly why it's so important to have a relationship with the Qur'an and what the consequences of not having one are? Have you ever wondered why some people can't really seem to connect with the Qur'an and what kind of practical steps can be taken to build that amazing friendship? Well, in today's exciting show, we'll be discussing all of this and more, inshallah. I hope you enjoy and benefit from this video. You've just tuned into Women's AM. This morning, I am joined by Sister Laika and Sister Halima to discuss uh, love for the Quran. Now, love is one of the most powerful emotions and is a driving force behind a lot of human behavior. But how many of us can claim to have a deeper or even similar love like that which we hold towards our family and friends with the Holy Quran? Have you ever heard someone in Salah sobbing during their recitation of the Quran out of humbleness and love for the Quran, or heard someone passionately speaking about the Quran with such admiration and affection towards it, and thought? to yourself, I wish I could experience that, but I'm not sure why I don't and how I can achieve it. Well, in today's show, we'll be exploring all of these things related to our emotional connection to the Quran. Now, if you have anything that you'd like to share with us on this topic, please do call in. The number is on your screen now. So, uh, like I want to come to you first. Um, what does love have to do with our connection uh, or our relationship with the Quran? I mean, everything uh, essentially <laughs> i wrote here everything um only because it's you know your mindset really affects the way you what you take from allah's words i mean the quran are the only authentic words that we have that are prescribed directly from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so there's a certain respect and value and kind of attachment you need to have to the quran and the quran's words so you can have a relationship with it. Um, there's a, um, uh, not article, there's a um, quote I wanted to read to you from a book called Think Great, Be Great. Uh, it says, miracles happen every day. You have to open your heart, mind, and soul to see these miraculous encounters. The Quran is a miracle in, it, in itself, right? So you need to open up your heart and your mind, and you need to be kind of open to loving the Quran. Because if you have this kind of mindset that, you know, you're defeated before you even begin, how can you even hope to get something from it? You know, and it's one of those things where you, sh you can make it easier for yourself. Because I know um, reading the Quran in Arabic is very poetic and it's not like normal um, Arabic dialect, right? So it can be different, d difficult to understand it. But you could read it in your native tongue. You know, you could listen to the Quran just to hear it, you know. Um, there's little things that you can do to increase your love for the Quran but it's extremely important that you have some kind of um, way in because if you see it as a huge task because it's quite a big book um, you could pick certain chapters which you um, look at the history behind them and you see what certain ayahs are you know interesting to you um, there's certain chapters which were um, revealed to the uh, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, specifically about certain parts in his life. Um, there's specific chapters that are about, um, you know, wives, uh, I mean, um, sorry, about Maryam. Uh, there's a specific chapter about different prophets. So you could pick one and work on one at a time. If you bring the whole book and you feel overwhelmed, you know, it's not going to necessarily be it's good. It's true. I think a lot of the times we do kind of stop ourselves from having that connection because, like you said, you know, we, we kind of take it as an entire chunk rather than taking it into pieces. And it, it it does get a little bit overwhelming you think oh my god how am I going to get through it you know or we set ourselves really unrealistic tasks and goals and that also kind of hinders us from establishing a relationship because we think I got to get through it in this amount of time yeah but uh, Halima in terms of that emotional connection um, what what impact does that have you know with uh, with our connection with the Quran you know investing our emotions into it uh, I would say the same as Sister Laika, you know, love has everything to do with our relationship with the Qur'an. At the end of the day, we have to realize that we're creatures of love. We love to love others and we love to feel loved back. And if we think about who is most worthy of our love and whose love we uh, is the greatest to, to receive, it's the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Qur'an is an extension of that love. Um, you know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, He will make a way for you to love the Qur'an. And similarly, if you love the Qur'an, uh, you are essentially loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that because Khabab ibn Ahad said, you know, do whatever you wish to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but no, you will never get closer to him with something more beloved to him than the Quran. Mm. And I think as well, we overlook the, the fact that why it's so important to love the Quran is because love is a prerequisite to willingly obey. We all want to obey the Quran so we can get the benefits from it. But, you know, religion is, uh, there's no compulsion in religion. It's all about freedom of choice. So we want to be able to go to the Quran in a willing state, wanting to do it out of, you know, for our own benefit, not yeah. because we think, being forced to do it. So in order to have that kind of um, that willing obedience, 
prerequisite to that is to fall in love with the Qur'an because when we love the Qur'an we will want to implement it mm -hmm. in our own lives. I think you know we can kind of uh, we can kind of see that in the way we interact with people in our daily lives and I think you yeah. know sometimes people do find it a bit strange or a bit of an uh, you know an idea that's kind of hard to kind of grasp like how do you love the Qur'an but when you look at you know what the things that you would do for the people that you love mm -hmm. you know you would go above and beyond for them you know you would go through to lengths that you wouldn't normally with anyone else and I think like you said you know when you have that love there you're going to have that willingness to obey and do your best to mm -hmm. you know to obey what Allah has, has commanded you to yeah. and and I think that's a really good way of putting it because a lot of the times we don't connect emotionally on that sort of in that sort of way you know people are always said you know uh, told oh you know Islam, uh, Islam and the Quran will bring you tranquility will bring you peace mm -hmm. you know and it will make you feel happy but love as an emotion is never really discussed in terms of, of the Quran but when it comes to actually finding examples within Islam you know that actually demonstrate this love and this connection with the Quran what can we find like a um, so I've got two examples I wanted to speak about. The first is a quick one. Um, Abdullah ibn Umar, um, he was a great scholar. He has been known to take eight years in reading Surah Baqarah. Um, and that's because he wanted to have the kind of purity in understanding what the text meant. Um, so taking his time to really read it and understand it and kind of trying to please Allah in that kind of slowness because um, a lot of the times we just rush and we feel like oh every um, syllable gives us this many rewards like, you know I need to read as many as possible but you know there's reward in trying to understand God's words and trying to connect with what you know the text means um, the other example I wanted to talk about was Abu Bakr um, he uh, had to leave Makkah because of the hardship that was um, going on in Mecca um, because of him spreading Islam and he was stopped um, by a polytheist leader who told him you know it's necessary you stay in Mecca because you're an important leader um, um, you know when the migration to Abyssinia was happening so Abu Bakr stayed and he was given a home um, but he was told you can't preach right from your home because you're staying in a polytheist house um, so he made a mosque in the yard of his home and when he read the Quran he always you know began crying um, because he found the word so beautiful and the nearby children, youth and women um, would stand against his wall and try to listen to him read. Um, and people like got so interested because he was so passionate and so invested in what the words meant. People felt that. And um, the man whose house he was staying at told him, like, you know, the only reason you're allowed to stay is if you don't preach. And he said, for me, the security of Allah is enough. You can take yours back. Um, and he continued in his mission of spreading Islam. But it's one of those things where even just him reading the words, made people interested you know got people invested in what he was doing um and abu Bakr is you know he's known for having that passion towards islam and towards the quran and towards the prophet muhammad and being very well. a very soft-hearted person yes. because there are so many sort of hadiths and narrations about you know how he you know couldn't get through reciting the quran because of the fact that he'd be crying so much yeah. and i think a lot we kind of we've we've lost touch with that sort of not i wouldn't say sensitive side but let's just say it kind of uh, because i can't find a better word <laughs> but as uh, you know as Muslims as a community we've kind of lost that sensitive side I think people are kind of always told to hold back you know you're being emotional you know why are you crying and you yeah, know man. yeah and it's uh, not just even for men I think just generally I think people are always told that you have to be tough you know like you you know as a Muslim you have to be tough you have to be firm but then we have the example of Abu Bakr Sadiq you know who was such a soft-hearted person that you know just the recitation of the Quran would just set him off and I yeah. think you know we have we've totally lost that and we've become so hard you know in terms of uh, not just our deen but everything in general that that makes it very difficult to I think connect with the Quran even on that emotional level in the way that Abu Bakr also did. Uh, Halima do you have any other examples that you could share with us? Yeah there's a beautiful example of a companion who was actually caught nicknamed the friend of the Quran and his name was Abad ibn Bashir and there's a beautiful incident where he was uh, it was about four years after the Hijra and the Prophet he had heard that there was a, a threat that the people of Najd, a Najd tribe wanted to attack Medina so in preemptive of this he deployed 400 men and soldiers to go to that to that village and when they got there obviously the villagers had seen the organization of the Muslims and they actually became scared and they fled to the to the mountains 
And subhanAllah, when the Prophet he came there and he saw that there was no danger and he left, on the way back they had the Muslims had camped that night. And it was the job of Abad uh, ibn Mashir with his friend Ammar to, you know, to guard the Muslims as they slept. And uh, when they were on night duty, he obviously saw his friend tired, so he, he, uh, um, he said, okay, I'll go first in terms of night watch. And there was actually somebody from the Nej tribe who had followed the Muslims. And so he was hiding in the dark and he actually came out and because he didn't perceive a threat, Abad, he actually started to pray and to recite the Quran out loud. And so that this person saw their chance and they shot him with an arrow. And while he was reciting the Quran, he simply just pulled the arrow out of him and continued in his recitation. And then he shot a second arrow and a third arrow and subhanAllah, he still continued with his recitation, just pulling the arrow out and throwing it on the ground. So when he had finished his prayer, he turned to his companion Ammar and he told him to get up and, you know, that he'd been wounded to take watch. And subhanAllah, obviously the, the attacker had fled when he saw his companion and he asked him why didn't you wake me why didn't you tell me and his response is something that I have to read because it's just so beautiful he said I was reciting verses of the Quran which filled my soul with awe and I did not want to cut short the recitation the Prophet Muhammad had commanded me to commit the surah to memory and death would have been dearer to me than the recitation of the surah should be interrupted so the fact that his love of the Quran was so strong and that it overrode physical pain and death I think is such a beautiful example for us in, in terms of the importance of building the emotional connection. You know what it is it is incredibly beautiful and I think you know when you have such a connection you know you t you feel like there's nothing that could be done or taken away from you and I mm -hmm. think you know one of the examples that we can even look at today which you know unfortunately is a very very situa sad situation is the situation of the children in Syria now you know the medical supplies are very very <laughs> short uh, in demand and, uh, I mean very high in demand and, and you know very uh, they're not available and unfortunately a lot of children are being told to recite the Quran you know while they're being operated on and children are actually doing this as a means to kind of take their mind off the pain you know of the fact that there is no uh, there's no yeah. anesthesia and they're having to go through surgical procedures um, and this is what they're doing to kind of help to comfort themselves is by reciting the Quran mm -hmm. so it's not really an alien concept uh, yeah, to not, use yeah. the Quran as a means of, of comfort through pain or to kind mm -hmm. of you know work through that pain as well Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to um, a lack of attachment or a lack of emotional attachment to the Quran, why is it that we, we find this, Sister uh, Halima? I think there's lots of different reasons. I think one reason could be because we simply don't feel the love of the Quran itself, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Quran. And again, that's no fault of the Quran itself, but of our relationship with it. Because we don't perceive it as something that we should have an emotional connection or that there's a need for it. Mm -hmm. We simply don't engage with it enough to fall in love with it. Mm -hmm. So because, uh, you know, we're human beings and at the end of the day if we feel loved by someone we can't help but reciprocate that but because we don't spend enough time with the quran where yeah. it's showcasing allah's love for us we're not necessarily feeling that love back so i think that's one thing not engaging with the quran enough but i think there's several other factors as well and it just comes to education a lot of people that genuinely want to have a relationship with the Quran, they just don't know how to go about it. Yeah. And that's that's one of the main reasons why I founded Quran Rehab is to show people there is a process and it's much easier than you think. Because we have all these misconceptions, you know, it's so hard, I'm not of that spiritual level, and all these kind of obstacles we put we put in our place. And I think another main reason why we don't have the emotional deeper connection with the Quran is because we don't really personalize our journey. We don't really approach the Quran from a personal point of view and make it something special and enjoy it and enjoyable, whether that's in terms of our learning styles, in terms of our motivation and things like that. Mm. I think, you know, it is true. I think a lot of the times we, we kind of, we hinder ourselves before we have even started. Mm. And it is quite sad that actually the only person that that impacts is ourselves. And I think mm. sometimes we don't understand how much we're holding back from ourselves I think there's always there's always potential and room for improvement and I think it's that fear that holds us back you know we tend to think like yesterday we were talking about how some people relegate it to imams and other people yeah. and say well you know what they're of a you know a spiritual sort of level that I can't reach so I'm just going to leave that to them I'm mm -hmm. not going to take it on because <coughs> I'm just not quite there mm -hmm. which is a sad thing I know uh, like you wanted to come in in terms of uh, some of the reasons why there might be a lack of, uh, of emotional connection. Yeah I came up with a few I think the first thing is we're a very distracted um, in terms of our relationship with not even just the Quran, the deen in itself. Um, we have a sort of static relationship with the deen. It's almost, I think, with, for the youth especially, it's seen as kind of a chore. 
to complete religious tasks. Mm -hmm. um, there's no kind of attachment there, um, and I think that stems from the way our madrasas are set up, um, the way parents teach their children about the deen, um, because if they're not getting that from like an establishment, an established place like their parents or the mosque, they're not going to be able to find that for themselves. Um, so not making it a chore, um, I think, is very important. And also, like you said, we don't feel like we can learn anything from the Quran ourselves. We go to the preachers instead for um, advice. So that's no, the problem. It, it is true, and I think you know sometimes we don't realize that you know it's that we turn the deen into a ritual, and we turn reading the Quran also into a ritual, and we're not really benefiting it from it from it in the way that we could. Michelle, we'll come back to the rest of this. We have had a really good dis uh, discussion so far, but we do have to take a quick break. But stay tuned because when we return, we'll be continuing on this discussion of falling in love with the Quran. We'll see you in a few minutes. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Women's AM. This morning I am joined by Sister Laika and Sister Halima to continue our discussion on falling in love with the Quran. Now if you've been listening in from the first part of the show please and you do have any suggestions or even things that you've done that have helped improve your emotional connection to the Quran please do call in and share that with us. The number is on your screen now. So uh, just before going on the break um, like we were talking about um, why sometimes people have a lack of an emotional connection with the Quran and uh, you made a couple of points but I know that you wanted to kind of uh, elaborate a little bit yeah so um, what I was saying is that a lot of the time um, I think it's become a nature where we whenever we have an issue with um, you know Islamic direction or you know uh, advice that we need we straight away call up uh, the you know the imam or a preacher on TV or whatever it is um, to ask for advice but it's one of those things where if we don't even try to look for the answer ourselves um, in the Quran and kind of confirm that with someone else we, we we just want a quick fix, fix, basically, and I think that really um, affects the way we have a, a relationship with, uh, you know, Islamic knowledge. Because of course we should, you know, um, go to scholars because that's what they're there for. You know, that's how we we, we should uh, get get some type of knowledge. But it's one of those things where we're Muslim and we're required in Islam to, you know, read and research ourselves. Um, and that will only increase our knowledge as well. So it's, you can't just rely on one source of information um, because it, it just makes it, uh, you, you become detached, I guess, from Islam because you're relying on one source instead of the source we've been given from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think that's a, that's an interesting point because we do find that a lot a lot of the time people don't want to do that research. I think people just say, you know what, I haven't got time. You know, the imam say he knows more than I do. You know, I'll just ask him and he'll give me the right answer. And I think you know you made a good point that you know when we take that you know. Although it's a good thing because obviously the imams are there to give us that guidance and to give us the, the correct interpretation. At the same time, you know, it does it does take away take us away from the Quran because when you research into something, you learn more about something, you find yourself more invested yeah. in what it is that you're learning. And I think that's another kind of it's another sort of thing that we do to ourselves to kind of distance ourselves from the Quran emotionally. Um, so, but what can we do in terms of you know advice of how to go about you know, actually deepening um, or even building an emotional attachment to the Quran, Halima. I think even as long as we're taking baby steps, inshallah, that isn't it, that is it's something. So, for example, something really simple is I always tell my students, allow the Quran to love you first, mm -hmm. because when you feel love from the Quran, you'll naturally want to reciprocate it back. How exactly do we do this? By like we said, being engaged with the Quran and reflecting on it, and doing tadabbur and reflecting, because when we look at the Quran, almost half of the Quran is just full of stories of the past and the prophets. Okay, we've already established that on previous shows. But when you, why, why are they there for? Not only just as role models, because what we're essentially seeing is in live action is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala interacting with man, and we see how beautiful Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, his attitude and his, and his interactions with human beings are. And we see for ourselves, you know, live in practice, we see Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's mercy and his love and all these things. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, he tells us about the creation and how he did all of this for us. So naturally, we are seeing the love of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala through the Quran when we engage and read it. And and naturally that will want uh, you in, you know kind of encourage feelings and good positive emotions back as well to the Quran and I think even simple things like being around people who love the Quran so you know being around people who you do see get you know their eyes welling up when they speak about the Quran or speaking about it so passionately because it's infectious you know these yeah. kind of emotions are infectious that's just the, you know human creatures that's what we're like so I've mentioned before in a previous show you know if you and I were friends and 
I didn't know such and such sister and you know you were really close to her and you had so much love and admiration you were always talking about her even if I didn't know that sister because you're always talking so highly of her naturally my heart would be inclined towards her as well mm -hmm. and I would feel some sort of love or respect for her so being around people who love the Quran is something that inshallah will also help to encourage our emotions yeah. and then another thing I would say is definitely about personalizing your relationship with the Quran so looking at um, looking at the Quran from your perspective because when you see the Quran affecting you in, as an individual in your life it's providing solutions for your problems mm -hmm. and you know providing added value to your interests this is something that's then going to take your emotional uh, connection to the next level inshallah and even in terms of our learning you know we don't recognize we don't realize how we're not personalizing our learning as well so for example if you're a visual learner and you're forcing yourself to study Quran through the auditory form this is something you're going to find difficult in your learning and naturally when there's something difficult we're not enjoying it we're yeah. not liking it and similarly if you're type, the type of person who's motivated socially so you're a bit of a social butterfly and this is how you like to interact if you choose to study the Quran in a way where you're just doing it at home one-to-one -one learning online this is not something that's going to um, be aligned with who you are as an individual you need yeah. to study the Quran in more of a social context with your friends and things like that it just becomes the time you spend with the Quran will be more special and more enjoyable and naturally that would just encourage positive emotions. Yeah, that's a good point because everyone tends to think that there's only one way of learning and I think that's exactly. something that we've uh, kind of fallen into as a community you know we're always told that you know whether you enjoy it or not is not the point the point is you're there to get the knowledge and I think mm -hmm. a lot of the times we ignore the fact that you learn something when you enjoy the method in which it's being taught I think that's the thing that gets parents a lot with their kids is that you know their kids will enjoy certain lessons that maybe not the so not so academic ones over the academic lessons and they'll be like but they're not important you should you know yeah. you know you should be focusing on this you should be enjoying these lessons because these are the ones that are going to benefit you and I think it says a lot about how we present knowledge how we approach these things as well and because and I definitely think <coughs> what you said is so important because you know when we say to our children it's not about enjoying it just just do the work just memorize yeah. the surah that's such a wrong approach because uh, at the end of the day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he intentionally created you every single one of you so different and that's for a purpose and he respects the fact that he did so as a matter of choice so you know subhanallah we need to respect ourselves in that sense as well and you know and, and I think that way will really help in a, in a deeper emotional connection. That kind of reminds me, you know, I've watched so many Revert um, videos, Revert stories online, and they always talk about a certain verse that spoke to them in the Quran. And it's always a verse in the Quran that, you know, drew them into Islam mm. um, because they try to look for something in the text which reflects how they were feeling, or they try to look for certain answers that they didn't get anywhere else. And it's one of those things where you need to realize why the Quran was created you know um, think about its purpose um, there's a verse in Surah Jama'at Ayah 2 and essentially Allah says why the book was sent down to us um, it says it is he who was sent amongst the unlettered a messenger from um, among themselves to rehearse to them his signs to sanctify them and this is the important part and to instruct them in scripture and wisdom although they had been before in manifest error um, so essentially what it means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the scripture so that we get more wise from it we we learn from it we become more knowledgeable and if you remind yourself of this purpose whenever you go to read the Quran you'll go with the intention of learning something new and becoming more educated and I feel like that's really exciting if you think about it like that instead of like oh I, you know I have to do this today it's my um, quota for the, for the day and you force that upon your children that's really wrong because it will become like a task for them they won't find it exciting or interesting anymore I think that's a really good point I think sometimes you know um, with your kids you know as adults I think a lot of the times you know you kind of resign yourself to okay this is how I learned it you know I didn't really enjoy it but you know alhamdulillah at least I got something out of it but then when you do have kids or you've got younger siblings it does force you to kind of rethink you know your experiences around the Quran and you mm -hmm. think to yourself I really didn't enjoy this growing up because we hear a lot about madrasas you know where you know uh, kids are you know um, you know abused they're beaten you know into memorizing the Quran and they're quite fearful and there's always fear and anger surrounding you know the learning of the Quran yeah. and you think to and for those who've been through that experience my mom is one of those who went through that experience Me she went too. to a madrasa this is in back home and um, you know the teacher did beat her and mm -hmm. she got so angry she said I'm never going back again and she never went back you know and then until she started practicing as an adult and that's when she started to go back to the Quran but from that experience that put her off completely mm -hmm. and I think you know we have to kind of rethink 
how we present the Quran to our family and how we present it to our children and to kind of think what did we like and what didn't we like yeah. about the way that we were brought up and how it, mm -hmm. it was presented to us and how can we do things differently and I think mm -hmm. a lot of times we, we sometimes tend to miss that. Yeah. And we definitely can't take love out of the equation with the relationship with the Quran simply for the fundamental fact that the greatest act of love itself is Allah SWT giving human beings the Quran. Mm -hmm. So it's all about love. Our relationship with the Quran. And I think we wouldn't we wouldn't know about that love unless we actually looked into the Quran because a lot of people tend to have a bad opinion of you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they go through such hardships and they just don't understand. They say, mm -hmm. you know, I am a good person, I always try my best, but these things happen to me, you know. How could Allah possibly love me, you know, um, when I'm going through all of these things and He's putting all of these, you know, burdens on my shoulders. And I think, you know, that kind of tells us once again that there is that disconnect with the Quran and that we need to go back to it because because obviously we've not understood, mm -hmm. you know, the purpose, we've not understood, you know, why certain things may be happening and and I think it's the attitude as well that we that we have in terms of how we see what is happening to us as well. And I think what you pointed out is really is it just draws back to the fact that when the Quran is full of stories of the prophets who went through similar hardships to ourselves and we see what wisdoms were behind it that mm -hmm. Allah SWT explains in the Quran, we can learn a lot more for ourselves. And you know, it's not just somebody telling us something, Allah SWT is showing us in real life examples human beings who we can relate to. Yeah. Um, so I think it's very, very powerful in that I, way. I think it's absolutely true. I think you know you got you have like the example of uh, Prophet Yusuf uh, salam, where you know he had hardship with family I think you you kind of think like okay his brothers left him for dead you know you can't get it can't get any worse with your family than that you know and I think you know if the Prophet you know Prophet Yusuf salam, was able to get through that I think we can find lessons in how he dealt with it and how he conducted himself to kind of help us get through our own family difficulties and there are so many like you said so many stories about the prophets in the Quran mm -hmm. that we can actually you know reflect upon and think okay how does this apply in my life how can I apply it to my life mm -hmm. but when it comes to actually sustaining that emotional relationship with the Quran what can we be doing to actually sustain it because sometimes it's very very hard to be consistent with certain things and certain actions and you know life gets in the way of, of things so how do we do it I think that when we're talking about something long term, we have to refer back to habits. And if we look at habits, habits essentially are consistent actions that we take as a result of certain thoughts and beliefs we have. So we have to make sure that first and foremost, the correct perception we have of the Quran, that the Quran, there is a process that falling in love with it is a very integral part of its obedience and of having a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understanding there is a process and that it's easy. And kind of just uh, clearing away all the disempowering we be beliefs we have about the Quran that, you know, some people they say, okay, I, I can't learn it, I can't engage with it because I don't have the language. But that's a self-imposed restriction. Or saying, you know, I'm not worthy enough of it. Um, or this is something that I don't need and not relevant to my life. So really just reviewing our concept and our perception of the Quran first mm -hmm. and foremost. And then I think it comes to preparation for action. And I would really, really, um, you know, suggest that people take time to invest in themselves in getting to know themselves. I know it sounds strange, but in the world of personal development as a coach, we realize how much people don't spend in getting to know themselves in terms of what motivations you have, what interests you have, things that are going on in your life, you as a person, your learning styles, and then so that when it comes to the time of taking action and building relationship with the Quran, you know to how personalize to go about it, it is very easy. Exactly. It can be a very easy and enjoyable uh, journey. And uh, uh, one last point from uh, Laika before we go. Um, I just wanted to say, make it a group activity. Um, don't do it alone, even with your siblings, husband, children, etc. You know, the Quran's the most authentic uh, form of Islamic history that we can get. So use that um, to, to kind of get close to the prophets and um, their lives and the lessons they, they can teach us. Absolutely. Jazakallah khair for that, sisters. Have you ever wanted to reconnect with the Quran in a way that's really special, that's personally meaningful and deeply fulfilling for you as an individual, where you feel like the Quran is truly a gift from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent to you in order to unleash the best of your potential and to transform your life for the better? If so, then why not check out my new online course, The Quran Blueprint, where you can learn how to achieve this and tons of other amazing things by simply clicking on the link on your screen now, inshallah, to find out more.